Hello and welcome into another episode of Lockdown Wolves. Today on the show, which Timberwolves players appeared on a Bleacher Report list for most underrated and also the worst contract list? They're different players. Which players do you think are on which list? I'll talk about what I agree and don't agree with there. Plus, Towns is playing for the Dominican Republic. It's all coming on the show. Welcome in. You are Locked On Wolves. You are Locked On Timberwolves. Your daily Minnesota Timberwolves podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hello and welcome into the Lockdown Wolves podcast, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. My name is Ben Beacon. I'm the host of Lockdown Wolves. Happy Friday, everybody. Happy weekend. And a big thank you for making Lockdown Wolves your first listen every day. Of course, this show is free and available everywhere, including YouTube, as well as all of your favorite audio platforms. Wherever you like to listen to podcasts, you can find Lockdown Wolves. You can also watch on the Lockdown Sports Minnesota app. If you haven't downloaded it already, head to your Roku or your Amazon Fire TV this show, along with all the other Minnesota Lockdown podcasts, are available there. More great local sports coverage 24-7, and it's free. Download the Lockdown Sports Minnesota app today on both Roku and Amazon Fire TV. It's a great time of year because we are in the midst of baseball season. The Twins are in first place. Check out Lockdown Twins. Brandon does a great job there. Of course, Lockdown Vikings training camp kicking off this week. Lockdown Golden Gophers with football starting here soon and lots of uh, PJ Flex stuff in the news this week. And uh, Lockdown Wild is in offseason mode, but... They're still with you multiple times a week, so go check it out uh, if you're also a fan of hockey. But there's a, a lot to check out over there at, at uh, the Lockdown Sports Minnesota app. You can also follow this show on Twitter at Lockdown T Wolves and also at B Beacon. That's with two B's, two E's, C K E N. All right, a few things to get to today. Uh, the main thing I want to cover is Bleach Report does these offseason lists that I think are interesting, just from a like a high level, like somebody at Bleach Report just pulling together an article based on. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't want to read too much into intentions, knowledge, et cetera. But like as a league wide scope, somebody that covers the league, do people really think, you know, what do people think about these categories of underrated players and overpaid players and, and Wolves players that land on either one of those lists? And if whether or not I agree with it um, and I, I mostly do, but I, I think I think it's still fascinating to kind of look at the breakdown and, and see like, hey. Yeah, Rudy Gobert's got a big contract. Are there other guys that maybe could have hit this list instead? So we'll do that for the bulk of the show. I, I want to hit the town stuff and the and the FIBA World Cup stuff first. And then we will get to ESPN Power Rankings. I know the last couple of days I had planned to get to it, but just didn't on the show. So we'll get to that last year today. Um, promise we'll get to it. All right, let's start with the town stuff. Uh, it's kind of a quick hitter. Uh, we talked last week about, I think it was the president or GM or whatever the, the official title is, whoever puts together the team for the Dominican Republic said that it was a 90% chance that Carl Anthony Towns would be playing for the DR in the FIBA World Cup. And now we have 100% confirmation that he will because Towns himself announced on Instagram that he would be playing for the Dominican Republic in the World Cup at the end of August. So um, that is happening. We know it's happening. It's exciting for Towns. He had mentioned it first back in March on Austin Rivers podcast. And then there was that report a week or two ago where the Dominican, Dominican Republic um, uh, team GM or president said 90% chance Towns does play. Now Towns has said on Instagram that he will. Uh, and he has, I, I had said before that he had previously played for them, you know, back around the draft. It was actually even before that. It was like, it was right before he even went to Kentucky. It was like 2012 um, leading into, you know, prior to the Olympics there. When Towns last played for the Dominican Republic, but he hadn't since then due to a variety of factors, injury, et cetera. Um, but now he's going to do it again. And, and I, I think it's exciting. I'm happy for Towns. I think it's it's great. Um, there's obviously injury concern for all Timberwolves players playing, but it is what it is, right? Like um, almost every great player, almost every player period wants the opportunity to play for uh, their country, represent a country uh, that, you know, is is near and dear to their heart. And, the, you know, I mean, Kevin Garnett did it, right? He played for Team USA a couple of times. So, um it's it's obviously well within these guys' rights to do it, and it's understandable that Timberwolves front office may be a little bit on edge because of it, but nobody's going to stand in their way, right? Um, and remember, there was a little bit of, uh, like, this wasn't too long ago. It was, what, the Olympics, uh, the postponed Tokyo Olympics, when there was the issue between Gerson Rosas' front office and Juancho Hernan Gomez after he hurt his shoulder. 
um, in a, I think it was a preseason. It was like a, like a exhibition prior to international play. It was an international exhibition prior to pool play. And Hernan Gomez had that bad shoulder dislocation and the Timberwolves claim their doctors never cleared Juancho to play. And Juancho says he was cleared to play was there at the opening ceremonies. And then the Wolves stepped in and said, you can't play. And then, you know, just weeks later, he was part of that Jarrett Culver trade to Memphis. And now Juancho has bounced around the league since then. So um, in that situation, it's hard to say exactly who is in the right, because if he was legitimately injured, the Timberwolves would seem to have the right to say, hey, we don't want you to play um, versus just, hey, we'd rather you're not in case you get injured. Right. Those are two different things. Um, but in this case, there's several Wolves players now we know that are playing like we know Ant is playing for Team USA. We know that um, Gobert is playing for France, obviously. Kyle Anderson recently was announced, I think, earlier this week. Officially, he's played for China. We've known Nick Alexander-Walker has played for Canada. Um, we know that Luca Garza is on the training camp roster for Team Bosnia. I think Matteo Spagnolo, same thing with Italy. And then, of course, Nas Reed on the select roster here in the U.S. So a chance Nas ends up on Team USA, but it's probably unlikely this year. Um, it's what Ant did a couple of years ago. So, I mean, all in all, if you include... Um, Garza and Spaniolo, you're talking, um, what it's like, that's like eight guys, right? Um, Ant, Rudy, uh, Kyle Anderson, Alexander Walker and Towns, that's five. And then you have Nas, Spaniolo, um, and, uh, and Garza. So that's, that's eight. If you include the three guys that are on the select slash training camp rosters, five that are for sure, almost for sure, for sure, uh, on the actual active roster for FIBA. So exciting stuff to see so many Timberwolves players involved on the international stage. And it's going to make for some fun, um, you know, I guess fun late August, early September basketball that otherwise there's just not as much going on. It'll give us, you know, something we'll cover here on the show. And, and uh, we'll definitely talk about how each Wolves player is doing, try and catch as much of that as, as I can um, to, to be able to report back on how those guys are playing. All right. Uh, let's get into some of those bleacher report stuff. I think it's pretty fascinating uh, we'll start with the with the most underrated player because I think that um, this is I don't think this is super controversial. This is a list done over at Bleach Report by Grant Hughes, and um, his his criteria for this is basically players. I mean, it's a uh, it's not exactly a an exact criteria. It's celebrating players who have made significant contributions to their teams for years, even if too few have noticed. Um, and basically, the criteria is that they haven't made the All Star team, but they're a good player. Uh, so. I don't know. I guess that's pretty good criteria for underrated. It's like number five is Steven Adams. I mean, I don't know that I'd put Steven Adams on an underrated list because people have known he's really good for a long time, but he's just never been great. And that's kind of Steven Adams, right? All of it. Basically, every team he's been on has been good. Um, it makes a lot of sense. Number three is Joe Harris from the Pistons. Uh, well, newly with the Pistons, but formerly the Nets. Uh, I don't know about that either, because like everybody knows, he's one of the best shooters in the league. Come on, Looney at number two, and then um, Alex Cruz at number one with the Bulls, which I could buy that. I mean, he's easily one of the best defenders in the league, and he's starting to get some recognition for that, but um, he probably uh, probably could get a bit more. And also, and the point that Grant makes in this article is pretty good, that the Bulls uh, still finish fifth in defense, defensive rating, despite having Vucevic, DeRozan, and Zach Levine on the roster. I mean, that's that's a fair point. Um, that's a lot a lot of bad defense to combat and still finish in the top five defensively. But the Wolves mention number four on this list is none other than slow-mo Kyle Anderson. And the point made in the article is uh, that it, well, I'll just read what he says. He says, Kyle Anderson graded out better than four-time defensive player, the Rudy Gobert defensive estimated plus minus. And he also topped Jaden McDaniels um, who could land a hundred dollar contract, hundred million dollar contract extension before the season kicks off. And then he says, we have to be careful because the catch-all metric, especially on D, is too noisy to make a definitive argument. But the fact that there's any data suggesting Anderson is even in the conversation with those two proves he's underrated. Um, that point to me, I, I don't know. I mean, like, there's obviously, I, I love to cite those defensive catch-alls on here because it's the closest thing we have to a legitimate defensive argument uh, besides steal and block rates, which he does go on to talk about. But also the eye test would tell you, Gene McDaniels is a superior defender, if only because team defense an actual one-on-one -on -one perimeter defense are two different things. Like you're not going to put Kyle Anderson on insert, you know, really good perimeter offensive player here. Like Kyle Anderson wasn't the choice to guard Shade Gilgis Alexander. Obviously, Nikhil Alexander Walker was because McDaniels was hurt in the play-in. But like McDaniels and Alexander Walker, like position matters, right? You're not going to put slow-mo in front of um an ultra quick point guard who Jaden McDaniels could probably contain. However, 
I think the catch-all shows Kyle Anderson is super good as a team defender and also a really good individual defender, depending on the situation. Like, it's all about finding the right um, situation to put your guy in. It, it actually goes back to what I talked about earlier this week about Torian Prince, how his metrics were really bad this year defensively. And I think part of it was the Wolves asked him to do maybe a little bit more than he was truly comfortable to do or able to do at this stage in his career. It wasn't necessarily because Torian is, is for sure already slowing down, although that could be part of it. And the Wolves, I thought, were pretty intelligent with the assignments they gave Kyle Anderson. And he can hold his own against virtually anybody. So I, I don't think anybody's arguing with the straight face that he's a better defender all the way around than Jade McDaniels or even Rudy Gobert. But the overall team impact and his ability as a versatile defender is really, really uh, important. I want to talk a little bit more about him. And I want to talk about uh, uh, the steel block and also rebound rate in context of the Wolves roster. And then we'll get on to the, uh, the overpaid players conversation. So we'll do all that here next. Today's episode of Lockdown Wolves is brought to us by our friends over at FanDuel. Take your first swing at betting MLB on FanDuel and get 10 times your first bet amount in bonus bets up to $200. That's right. Just bet 20 bucks and you'll land $200 in bonus bets, win or lose. That's 200 that you can spend betting everything from the money line to the over-under to who you think is going to hit the first home run in a given game. All that is on an app that's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Plus, when you win, you can get paid instantly. It's the perfect time of year to bet baseball. As I mentioned earlier, the Twins are still in first place in the Central, um, kind of almost to the like really the home stretch of the baseball season, just a couple months left. Also, NFL training camps, you can still bet at WNBA. Uh, I would imagine FIBA World Cup will be on there, so there's plenty at FanDuel. But there absolutely is no place better to bet on MLB than FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Sign up today and visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn. To get up to $200 in bonus bets, that's FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, official partner of Major League Baseball. All right, talking a little bit more Kyle Anderson, uh, this article at, at Bleach Report goes on to talk about his steal and block rates. This is interesting, actually, uh, for as much as I think some of the other stuff was pretty surface level. It says only 27 players in NBA history with at least 12,000 minutes have steal and block rates above 2%. Anderson is one of them, occupying space alongside the likes of generational defenders like David Robinson, Hakeem Olajuwon, Sean Marion, Ben Wallace, Andre Kirilenko, and Draymond Green. That's really interesting. Actually, I like I I mean, it makes sense. Right. Um, and actually, if you look at, at Kyle Anderson in context of the Timberwolves roster last year. Um, obviously, he's in, you know, ranks highly in all of those categories anyway. So steal rate, he was fifth on the team in steal rate. Well, actually, really, you could say he was third because uh, more in my net ranked ahead of the, him in relatively uh, low minutes. So Jordan McLaughlin is first, then Ant, then Kyle Anderson. If you take out more in my net block rate, he was fifth, but again, take out my not and more, and he's behind Gobert and Nas Reed, ahead of Jaden McDaniels, ahead of Anthony Edwards, ahead of Alexander Walker, Carl Thitty Towns. So top three in steal rate and block rate. Assist rate, uh, he was third behind McLaughlin and D'Angelo Russell. So, um, I mean, I guess D'Lo still played two-thirds of the season with the Wolves, almost. Rebound rate, if you pull out A.J. Lawson, which you should because he played in one game, and pull out Josh Minan and Luca Garza, who played limited minutes, he was third behind Gobert and Reed. Uh, we're actually, no, I guess he would have been, I guess he ended, ultimately he was fifth behind Gobert, Reed, uh, Cat, and depending on how you feel about Knights, 38 games played. But either way, top five rebound rate, either four or five, top three assist rate, top three steal rate, top three block rate on the entire team for Kyle Anderson. Um, not surprising because he is a really, really, I would say elite in terms of all around um, being able to do a little bit of everything, right? I mean, He's never thought of as a shooter, but he shot a career best forty one percent last year. And and I and I talked about this a lot going into the offseason. Teams leave him open for a reason. I mean, he shot thirty three percent the year before. He's had a couple seasons below thirty percent from the arc. So last year was just he picked his spots, uh, you know, intelligently. He shot a ton of corner threes and and was like, what was he? He was forty seven percent from the corners, which was easily his career best mark. Um, but he still still shot forty one percent when he took them. He was good all the way around. He's a above average defender. 
He is an above average rebounder for the role that he plays. Even when he plays the four, you know, those numbers aren't quite as impressive. In fact, last year was actually a career low rebound rate for Kyle Anderson. Um, but he's still competitive on the glass. And, you know, to the point of that statistic in terms of over 2% steal rate block rate, um, last year was actually only the second time in his career that his steal rate wasn't above 2%. It was still 1.9. Every single season since year three of his career, so the last seven seasons, he's been over 2.1%. And in fact, it's basically the trend line goes upward. Last year is actually a career high block rate for Kyle Anderson. So um, I 100% agree with him being underrated, and I bet the Wolves will try and extend him in season next year. Um, it probably won't be easy to do. It's going to be his age 30 season. And, and this is probably in slow mo's mind, his chance to hit the market one last time when he's still in his prime, or even if it's the back end of his prime and get one more multi-year deal. I'm sure the wolves will probably push for, I bet they'll open with a Patrick Beverly special and try and extend him for one more year during the season and just like out of here to the end of the deal. Um, but otherwise, do you talk something long-term? I mean, the way that Kyle Anderson plays it's not like athleticism, losing any athleticisms, there's not a whole lot to lose, right? And I don't mean that in a, I mean, I do mean, like, it is what it is, right? He's nicknamed slow-mo for a reason. Um, but he probably will age well, I guess is what I'm saying, based on his profile and the way that he plays. So I expect the Wolves to try and extend him in season. I, I just don't know how feasible that's going to be. If I'm if I'm Anderson, I'm probably looking to hit the open market one last time to, for a, for a multi-year, you know, somewhat lucrative deal. All right. Um, let's talk about the other Bleach Report article about the worst contracts in the league. And this was written by Zach Buckley. The last one is Greg Swartz. This is Zach Buckley, uh, titled predicting the NBA's worst contracts next season. Um, and so he says, he basically, he, he wrote this. The intro is because Jalen Brown just signed that huge contract, uh, which technically is the richest contract in league history. Um, talks about how that's a rich contract for somebody who's not a top 10 talent. Then goes on to talk about worst contracts. He says that they he leaves out Lonzo Ball because obviously the the serious injury issues. Then he goes into the top five, number five on his list for worst contracts in the league, none other than Carl Anthony Towns. Uh, and he lists the new five years, two hundred seventy point six million with player option in the final season contract. And he says the way Towns sees it, he's a game changing talent who's already left an indelible mark on the sport of basketball. In reality, he's a one way player who has never impacted winning the way his numbers would make you think. Goes on to say some of the things we've all seen people say before about cat. And then he says um, he's been the best player on bad teams and the second best than mediocre ones. He lists the Timberwolves winning percentage since he was drafted as the sixth worst in the league. I think for, for somebody who's a, an ardent cat defender and obviously somebody who's covered the Timberwolves for a while uh, and, you know, grew up following the Timberwolves as a huge fan. I like, that that's a fair assessment of Towns' career. I think it's fair to say he's been the best player on bad teams and the second best on mediocre ones. I don't I don't know that you could make an argument with a straight face that Carl Anthony Towns has led the Wolves to anything. And now, I would argue that he was still like he obviously played limited uh, a limited amount of time this last year, but I could argue in the last couple of years, like two years ago, you could argue he was the best player on that team. Um, on the, on the team that won 46 games, right? Like, I mean, I know that the national view may be, oh, it was the best player, but two years ago, I, when this team wins 46 games and takes Memphis to, to six games in the first round, I don't know that you'd argue. I wouldn't argue that, that it was a more important player to that team than Towns and Towns played 74 games that season. The injury issues are relatively limited. So I would argue that would be the exception it would be two years ago, but I understand the concern over, uh, not concerned, but I understand positioning it, you know, otherwise, right? Like his rookie year, the Timberwolves won 29 games. The next year, they won 31 games. The next year, they won 47, but that was the Jimmy Butler year. The following year, they won 36 when they traded Butler early in the year. So I guess you could argue Towns, was, and that still wasn't a good team. They only won 36 games, but it wasn't a horrible team. The next year is when they went 19 and 45 and were able to draft Ant the following season. And that obviously was the really, really disappointing year um, in there prior to the uh, to the acquisition of, of D'Angelo Russell, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, and then obviously more recent history, we're all aware of what happened there. So, I, you know, you really only would argue that the year before the last one, when they won 46 games and lost to Memphis in the first round, and then the 36 win year are the two years that the Wolves were best when Towns was their best player. And you combine those two records and it's 500. 46 and 36 one year, 36 and 46 the other year, which is about right. 
if you if you look at what Towns has actually done in terms of his on court value, I, I get that. Like in sitting here right now, I couldn't say with a straight face. I think Towns could be the best player in a championship team. Now, if the Wolves turn into a championship team with the roster mostly as currently constructed in the next two to three years it's likely it becomes the Wolves' best player in the next two to three years. That's what the front office and the coaching staff is banking on, right? And then Towns would be the second best player at a championship team. So I, I get the argument, and, and that goes back to like how good the Wolves were with Jimmy Butler and how good they've been you know, when Ant has played really well. So I understand that argument. Um, I do struggle. I mean, like he's 27, though, right? So I don't think that contract is prohibitive. Um, and, and as Howard Beck said on the show several weeks ago, like teams will be interested in Carl Anthony Towns when the Wolves decide they do want to trade him, if and when they decide that they do want to trade him. Um, all right, let's talk about the other Wolves contract on the list. I bet you could guess who it is. We'll get to ESPN Power Rankings here at the close of the show as well. All right, Carl Anthony Towns is fifth on the NBA's worst contract list, according to Zach Buckley over at Bleacher Report. Number four is none other than Rudy Gobert. Real quickly, I'll, I'll list the top three. Number three, Duncan Robinson of the Heat. Number two, Ben Simmons of the Nets. And number one, Bradley Beal, recently acquired by the Phoenix Suns. Um, Gobert's number four. I actually don't know that I could argue with this. I, I wanted to because I, I'm a little bit tired, as I'm sure many Timberwolves fans are of the national, like, uh, the Wolves can't do anything right because they did the Gobert trade. Because as I've said before, this is mini soapbox time. Mi mini soapbox. There's more off-season time for soapboxes when it comes to national narratives, I promise. Um, yes, the Wolves overpaid for Rudy Gobert. Yes, Rudy Gobert is also paid a little bit too much money for what he can do. However, it doesn't mean that nothing else they do could is bad or that, excuse me, that everything else they do is bad, right? And we've actually talked about how a lot of the moves on the fringes have made a ton of sense for this team. The Kyle Anderson signing, a lot of the one-year deals last year, the uh, the Mike Conley trade, the draft night trade this year seems to be universally regarded as really intelligent to get Leonard Miller. Um, it, it's hard to find anything that Tim Connolly has done besides, and I get that this is like, this is the, you know, how was the play otherwise, Mrs. Lincoln question, right? Like, I get it. This is the big thing that happened, you know, less than 13 months ago. It's what Tim Connolly will be known for forever unless the Wolves, you know, do something crazy and, and uh, you know, win a championship in the next couple of years. I, I understand that. But, like, the other moves still matter, too. And, and they're all kind of being done in the wake of this Gobert trade last year. The other thing is, I don't know that Gobert would be on a list like this if he wasn't. A, if the if there weren't so many assets given up to acquire him, and B wasn't playing next to another center with a big contract. And I understand contract or excuse me, context matters, but I don't know. Like Rudy Gobert is still a multi-time defensive player of the year uh winner. He's still, I mean, he's 31, but like there's only what? Uh two this year and next year, and then a player option, which undoubtedly at age 33, he'll take his 46 million or whatever. But still, it's not like there's five years left on the deal. There's this year, next year, and a player option. So, like, he becomes much more tradable after the season, in my opinion, because he's still a, he's still obviously a very good player. There's no question about that. And yeah, I know the defensive metrics slipped a little bit, but like, you look at this list. I looked at the list of the top cap hits league wide, um, and obviously Bradley Beals is is a worse deal. I mean, he's also 30 and he's getting 46 million this year. Gobert's getting 41 million this year, and also. Another really important way to look at at salaries is percentage of cap. And I think we're going to start, that'll be with the cap shifting as much as it does. I think that provides some valuable context. Bradley Beal's getting almost 35% of the cap this year. He'll be getting almost 36% projected next year, uh, the year after this coming one. Gobert's 30% of the cap. So it's it's 5% less of a cap hit than Bradley Beal. So I 100% understand with Beal or agree with Beal being first. I'm on board with the Duncan Robinson thing too. Obviously he had a mini revitalization in the playoffs or in the finals this year. Um, so, you know, it doesn't really change the fact he's getting paid a kajillion dollars to be a role player. Um, and who's the other one? Uh, ben Simmons. Well, yeah, that's kind of an obvious one. 
Um, but you look at these other cap hits, it's really hard to argue for anybody else as a worse deal than Gobert. Gobert is the 13th highest paid player in the league in terms of this year's cap hit. Again, percentage to cap, I think, really matters too. Um, but some of the guys ahead of him that are older, like Clay Thompson's 33, well, he's a better player. Jimmy Butler, 34, same thing. Dame, 33, same thing, although he's often been injured too. The only ones I would maybe argue would be Paul George and Kawhi Leonard. And I think the only reason that they're not on this list is because they've got a year, actually two years less on their deal because each of them, this is their last year plus a player option for next year. So that's why you've heard a lot about potential extensions for the Clippers this year for Kawhi and Paul George, because the Clippers need to make that decision now or else they'll, these guys will exercise their player options next year, or maybe not. Maybe they'll hit the, hit the market looking for their last big contract at age 33, 34, uh, because sitting here right now, Paul George is 33, Kawhi Leonard's 32, and they're both injured all the time. And I struggle with, uh, like, I mean, they're each going to get $46, 47000000 million this year, which is, again, like, what, $6, 7000000 million more than Gobert. And I bet Rudy Gobert plays in more games, and he's four years younger. It's just, again, the length of the contract is really the only thing um, that that really alters this. So putting that, putting that context into it, and if Gobert was still on the Jazz, I don't think he makes this list of top five worst contracts. It's simply because... He has this stigma around him because of the price the Wolves paid, and he's also playing on a team with another center with a massive contract. That's the only reason why. You'd still probably say it's top 10 worse regarding the, of the situation that he's in, um, or, or regardless of whether he was at Utah or Minnesota. It's just, it's really just the, the context of the price paid and the, the, the players on the depth chart around him in Minnesota, um, in my opinion, are, are why he hits this top five worst contract list currently. All right, closing the show, getting to ESPN Power Rankings that um, I have been putting off all week. Uh, I think this is just a, I always preface this by saying, like, I don't take Power Rankings as gospel. Nobody should, um, especially ESPNs. But as we get into the season, I'll periodically do, uh, if you're relatively new to the show, I do a check-in on various Power Rankings. Visit, you know, NBA.com, CBS Sports. Um, there's a couple others that are pretty good, athletic. And I just kind of, like, take those as a whole and say, you know, evaluate if they're, um if they're ranking the Wolves appropriately. This offseason one from ESPN, it's close. It's similar to the one we saw around the draft. The Wolves are at uh, 16. It's hard to argue that. They were 42 and 40 this year, so by definition, a pretty middle-of-the-pack team. It's got them ahead of the Pelicans, ahead of the Hawks, ahead of the Nets, Jazz. I agree with all that. So I, I agree with them being ahead of all the teams behind them. Has them one spot behind the Thunder, which, like, I think the Thunder's range of outcomes this year could be anywhere from basically last year to frankly, a top five team in the West. I think it's possible because it's essentially the same team, but they're adding Chet Holmgren. They're adding um, the guy from the EuroLeague. I blank it in his name, but the EuroLeague MVP. They're, you know, they're shoring up that roster. They're obviously very savvy. Dagno's a great coach. Um, so I, I get it. I guess I get them being ahead of the Wolves. The Mavs at 14. I don't really like that because I, I know that that's like, oh, they have Luka and they have Kyrie. So they should be good, but they're not. They won 38 games last year and they were bad with Kyrie. So, I struggle with just giving them 14 on this on this list. I'd probably put them behind the Wolves. I guess I ha I get having the Knicks at 13 because they did go to the second round. The Kings had a great regular season. So I guess this is close enough for me. I'd probably bump the Wolves up one spot if I'm quibbling here and, you know, still behind the Thunder, but put Dallas behind Minnesota. So I'd go Dallas 16, uh, Wolves 15, Thunder 14. And then above that, you know, Kings at, excuse me, Knicks at 13, Kings at 12, Clippers at 11. Fine. I'm always very, very kind of dubious about any Clippers ranking because you can't assume relative health for them like you can for other teams. It's just not reasonable. Uh, but anyway, I'm okay with this ranking overall. I think the Wolves are probably right in that 14 to 16 range. I'd plug them right in at 15 league-wide sitting here right now in late July. Um, but hopefully that changes. And, and of course, rosters could still shift. There could still be trades. I don't know how much uh, I think it's unlikely a whole lot happens, but you know, wolves wise, I guess they still obviously have that open roster spot. We'll keep talking about that and an open two way deal too. Uh, so of course we'll keep covering that. We'll be back on Monday. Um, we're going to go to three times a week next week. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday is the plan. Make sure to tune back in a big thank you to those of you that do make locked on wolves. Your first listen every day. It is greatly appreciated. Of course, this show's free and available everywhere, including YouTube, as well as all of your favorite audio platforms. You can also watch on the Lockdown Sports Minnesota app on both Roku and Amazon Fire TV. You can follow on Twitter at Lockdown T Wolves and also at B Beacon with two B's, two E's, C K 
E-N. Of course, the Lockdown Wolves podcast is part of the Lockdown Podcast Network. Remember, the Lockdown Network is your local experts on all the biggest stories. Once again, I'm Ben Beacon. This is the Lockdown Wolves podcast, and we'll catch you next time. Have a great weekend.